All right, in example M.3, we are really for the first time applying the moment distribution uh, method. And we've, we've set it up in the previous two videos, the background, but now we're going to go straight at it here. And we'll, we'll do a little bit of drawings along the way to indicate the physical meaning of what's happening at each and every step. We start with the relative stiffness of each of the members. And in a previous one, we had defined K to be equal to I over L, and so the other member here then um, had a 2I over L, so therefore was equal to 2K. Now in terms of setting up uh, your actual work, what you really want to do is draw lo vertical lines at each and every one of these joints. That's going to be, uh, well really the math that we're going to do is going to look very tabular in its orientation. Right, and so this first row we've got are these relative stiffnesses that we have for each member, K and 2K. And then remember the distribution factor is just that at that particular joint, we're going to take the K of that member divided by the sum of all of the members that frame into that joint. In this case, there's only two. So that's K over 3K, or a one-third factor. And then the other one, of course, would be two-thirds factor. The sum of all of those has got to be one at that joint. Now, at this far left end, since it's a pin member and it's only um, whatever happens here is going to come right back into that member, that distribution factor is K over K. And at the other far end, we have then also 2K over 2K or a 1. Some people like to also box those to make sure that they aren't thought of as member and moments that we're going to be starting to do next. Okay. Now this next step of these fixed end moments, the physical analogy that we're playing with is that we're going to come in and temporarily lock down each and every one of the joints, including that middle, and we're going to impose whatever all of the member forces are. And so we got 160 kilonewtons. That's going to create fixed end moments. Now remember that for this case of a mid-span load, the fixed end moments were a minus and plus of the PL squared over 8. Right? So that would be 160 times uh, 25 divided by 8 or 5. That's not right. <laughs> not PL squared over 8. That's just PL over 8. And remember, you want to have your handy tables available for you to do that. PL over 2, that's why I got a little confused and threw that L over 2 into that thing. So it's PL over 8 on one end, PL over 8 on the other. Notice clockwise positive, counterclockwise negative there. And so when you do that, you will get then minus plus 160 times 5 over the 8, so kilonewtons times meters, and we get minus plus 100 kilonewton meters. So we want to come down then in our table and put those in the right place. Left end of member BC, we have a minus 100. The right end, we have a plus 100. We have imposed a member load and created a moment here at each one of those joints of that kind of magnitude. Right. So now what we're going to do in the process is we are going to alternately release a joint, let it equilibrate, and then we're going to see what carryover effects we have, and then we'll lock the joint back down, and we'll release another joint. So let's start at the far right, since that's a pin end. Let's go ahead and release that. Now, as it's sitting there, it's got on the joint this 100 fixed end moment and on the end of the member we've got also 100 and so when we release it what we're really doing is we're temporarily looking at a system that we have replaced we've gotten rid of the 160 kilonewtons we've got the fixed end moments that do the same effect on the joints and we're going to come along and we're going to say well now <clears throat> we've got this 100 sitting here going counterclockwise which means right, clockwise on the member end, counterclockwise on the joint, that's going to in effect want to rotate this thing here. 
right? Because right now it's locked down, and as soon as we release it, pop, it's going to want to do one of these things as a net, right? So in response to this 100, we have to end up having then develop a minus 100 when pop, we release it because we get a net of zero, right? Which is, of course, what we were trying to do up here to begin with. Now remember, whenever we have this moment that's sitting here, a 100, we get a carryover to the other side that is one half, right? If it goes that way. If it goes the other way, then it would be one of these deals of 100 and then same thing. Remember here, the sign convention is such that either clockwise is positive on both ends, so this is really a positive 100 and a positive 50. This one's a minus 100 and a minus 50, so we have an effect over to the other side of developing minus 50 in response to when we release this and we equilibrated that joint, that's why we have the underline, and popped it over, that's the carryover. And the carryover factor here would be called one half, and in the general case, that's what you will end up with. You apply the carryover factor, when we release this, see what happens, and it pops over. All right, so that's really this particular case. We have the negative 100 to counter what was going on here on the member end. This is really the member end, no longer the joint here. So countering this one to get a zero, let's not look at that one anymore. Now when we go to the middle joint, by the way, we're going to lock that one back down again. So now we have accumulated, I'm not showing the deflected shape that would have gone along with that. Um, we've accumulated now a 150 sitting here. That's a negative 150. That's what you see here. So now we want to pop that one. Everything else has been locked down again, and we distribute it according to the relative stiffness. That's what we talked about in example M.2. Right? It didn't seem so apparent because we only had one member here, but now we're going to distribute this unbalanced moment, minus 100 plus a minus 150. 50 or minus 50, so a total of negative 150, all of the moments that are here, and we're going to redistribute then the opposite effect in the one third, two thirds bis ratio according to the distribution factors. And so that will become a plus 100 and a plus 50. We have equilibrated that joint, and we will lock it back down again. We shoot across carryover effects. which are whatever that member end moment is times a half the carryover factor in this case. Yes, there are times the carryover factors don't have to be one half. So that pops over. General case, that will always be the case. Pops over. Now let's release this one. That's a minus 25. That pops back over at minus 12.5. Now we have a choice here. We could have gone back over to the far right and um, done something here. And if we do that, we'd actually get a, a very interesting pattern that we would actually be almost done with this process. But I'm not going to pretend like I don't know about a way to make this go a little bit faster here. So 12.5 divided by 3 is 4.167. And so 167, I'll just call it 4.17 and that would develop on that side. It gets a carryover to back to the left at 2.08, but we still have this one over here to deal with. So that's 8.33, right? So that negative 12.5 is the unbalanced. We have to have a resisting or restoring moment that's opposite of that totally. And so these two sum up to that in an opposite fashion. And the, according to the distribution factors, kicks over at half of that, 4.17. Now note, the total buildup since the last time I released this joint is starting to get pretty big. It'd be a good idea to go ahead and pop that one. Remember, we're just alternately releasing and then letting things come to equilibrium. 
redistributing their effects with the carryover. That becomes 27 point, you know, about 2708. You're going to ask, how many digits should I be carrying? I usually don't even go to the hundredth here, which does introduce some numerical error, but generally it's not that big a deal um, at the tenth of a kilonewton meter. Minus 2.08 comes back over here as minus 1.04. I sum up now all of the unbalances that we have here. I'm just going to double check the math. Oh, yeah, there, see, that's what I want to make sure of. That negative 54.17 needs to come over as negative 27.08, right? And so plus the 1.04. So we have a total unbalance there of 28.125. Divide that by 3, and we get then a plus 9.25. Three eight or so, um, that carryover would be four point six nine. This part is eighteen point seven five. Now your choices of when to release things does do have an influence about how long it takes before you decide you're done. And right now we have these numbers are just too big to say, think that we are done, and I haven't really indicated to you when that is yet, but let's just see what's going to happen here, and you'll begin to get a feeling for what, when we can say we're close enough. And so I'm alternately releasing and redistributing and then re, uh, reclamping down, sending things across, Notice now, I'm instead of going left to right, right to left, I'm now actually going from out, both out, back to both in. Um, let's see, this will be minus 4.69, and then this one is a minus 2.34. Add those up, and you may already have figured out what's going to happen. That's 7.03 total and then divide that by 3 to get the left one and lo and behold that turns out to be the same thing just the opposite number because we're already now into a ratio of 2 to 1 and we really could effectively stop here but the real rule of thumb here is that you're trying to get to real small numbers on these carryovers and until you get there you really can't stop yet. There's a special situation that has emerged in this particular case because of the ratios that turn out to be. This is not always going to be true for that to happen. You have to be a little bit clever sometimes in how you do this, but notice that now generally these numbers are getting smaller and smaller as we are equilibrating things. We're distributing the load. That's the notion of moment distribution. See, that needs to be a negative. Now, if you kind of forget to release one, you can always come back later and do it. The only thing that's sort of devastating is if you make a mistake in writing down a number. That's, that's where you get a little off and have some problems. Now, we're getting really close to small numbers. Um, let's see, that will be a plus 0. Point. Wow, we're really getting to, to rounding near here. 3 0 over there. That's still about 5 9. Minus 0. 0.59 gets shot back as then minus 0. 0.3. This becomes minus 0. 0.3 and gets shot across as then minus 0. 0.15. That's you notice this pattern that I was lucky to stumble into? Well, it wasn't really luck. I, I anticipated this was, would happen, and we could have actually done some things about that at the very beginning. But we'll get to that in another time. But notice how small this is, this is getting, and we're not really getting any new resolution to what's happening. In other words, we're numerically converging to the results. And if all we care about is the nearest kip foot or the nearest kilonewton meters, we, we have really actually met our requirements here of numerical accuracy. And so I'm going to put double lines in, indicate I'm done. Now, 
Now what do you do? Well, now you sum up the entire column. That's the accumulation of moments. Um, and it's really easy on this left end, right? Because we always have these opposite values. That was because of the, the distribution factor was 1. Whatever we shot here and then we released, we always got the same thing coming back because we're supposed to have a net 0 there. And that's what our math is going to show. And in both cases, that's what we're going to end up with out there. Now, what we have in the middle, if you add up all these things, is it's going to turn out that as you add them all up, you're going to end up with a positive 50 and a negative 50. You may not trust me, so go ahead, do the addition and subtraction to see that it really works out that way. In other words, we really actually, in this very unique problem, could have stopped after the first time around. Um, yeah, it's not generally going to be true when you're working it out with this general method, but it does turn out to be that way in this case. Right? And so this is an iterative way, a numerical sequence of, again, the physical analogy, locking everything down, applying the loads, taking one joint, releasing it, letting it rotate under the unbalanced moment. It goes to equilibrium, distributes its effects according to relative stiffness, just like we saw in example M.2. So if you're not really sure how this is all working, go look up that video and review it again. And we keep doing this, alternately locking in and unlocking and then relocking and distributing effects back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's really easy math to do and a lot easier to do than say the slope deflection method um, and yes you could set this up in a spreadsheet to do your work pretty quickly and it'll you have to be a little trick careful in how you copy paste formulas and how you set that up but actually you can do this very easily in a spreadsheet if you wanted to now the real power of this was 40 years ago when uh, you weren't going to do you didn't even have spreadsheets you were going to do this math maybe even with a slide rule and um, or abacus or some you know I, you joke but actually people with abacus can move a lot faster than people with a slide rule to be honest when they know what they're doing and you could but nonetheless you could do these calculations really fast there's just simple addition subtraction multiplication and division that's all that's going on math wise and you get iteratively then what the um, moments are at the end one thing I don't get is I get no information about the actual rotations or the member end displacements, but I do get the member end uh, moments from which then I can go do a lot of other things.